Hi, so has anyone here ever broken any bones? I have. Well, then you know it's not a very fun experience going through all the casts and rehab and whatnot. Well, something you wouldn't expect is me breaking bones kind of inspired me and got me into orthopedics. So my name is Bryson Strawn, and my topic for ISM this year was orthopedics. And some of the reasons why I chose it was because of experiences with broken bones. I spent a lot of time throughout my life in doctor's offices with orthopedics, orthopedic sur surgeons and doctors and physicians, and basically with all the sports. I basically played every sport you can imagine. And through all that, a lot of broken bones and injuries. And even though it may seem like I know what I want to do, you can never really be sure. So part of the reason I took this class was to make sure of that. And my quote helps define that. Definiteness of purpose is the starting point of all achievement. And that basically is saying that once you know exactly what you want, you can achieve. So I'm trying to figure out exactly what I want through this class. So here's a little bit about me. I'm a senior at Frisco High School. I played on the football team all four years and ran track for one year at FHS. Next fall, I will be attending the University of Texas at Austin. And I can't wait for that. And I plan on majoring in economics. That might seem like a weird major for me because I'm doing orthopedics as my subject, but I'm not really sure what I want to do yet, like I said in the quote. And it just seems like a good general major that will help me figure that out. And so, why ISM? I took this class not only because I wanted to figure out what I want to do in the future with my life, but I also wanted to like, gain some great real world experience and just help myself develop into an adult and grow as a person. And so a, um, a lot of what has helped me learn about my career so far is doing research. So I've done a lot of research assessments and here's some highlights from the year. The first one I did was a career outlook assessment. And that basically just gave me the overview of being an orthopedic physician and being a physician. With their median pay is about, it's extremely high with at almost $400,000 a year. A doctoral professional degree is needed as entry level education needed. And that basically is saying that you have to take, after undergraduate, you have to take about eight or more years of school, which is kind of scary to most because that's a lot of school and a lot of money. And the job growth is very high at 18%, which is much faster than any average job growth. And basically, the difference between an orthopedic physician and a regular physician is orthopedic specifically works with the musculoskeletal system of the body. The next research assessment I did was specializations of orthopedics. So this isn't every single one, but this is just a majority of the specializations. and. The first specialization is orthopedic oncology. And that picture in the top left corner, that shows a little tumor in the bone of the leg. And oncology deals with cancer, if you did not know. And it was just interesting getting to learn about that specific one, because you have a lot, there's a lot more pressure on you if you're that, because you've got to deal with tumors and cancer. Next one is podiatry, and that deals with feet. Uh, then there's pediatrics, which is a child orthopedic doctor, then there's shoulder, spine, sports medicine, and hand and plastic, and most of those are self-explanatory, but it was just great to get to see all the different things that you go into and how more specific, like being an orthopedic doctor is already specific, but then you can specialize even more than that and do one of these things and just learn so much about a specific part of the body so you can help people with that. The next um, research assessment I did was orthopedics and sports medicine and I got interested in doing this research assessment from the last one because one of the specializations was sports medicine. And it's surgical and non-invasive. Non-invasive basically means non-surgical where like, like you would expect like a cast for a broken bro bone or just like a sling. That's non-invasive. And it basically just focuses on athletic related injuries like sports, anything like that. And for to become one of them, you have to go through a one to 10 year fellowship which is a pretty big span like one year is really short but 10 years could be a really long time so that kind of it's a little bit scary to think another 10 years after already being in med school for another eight and doing that so for my next uh, research assessment it was getting into medical school 
And as you know, that is a very major part of becoming a doctor because you have to go to medical school to become a doctor. So I thought it would be a good idea to look into that more. And so some of the main points I learned from doing this research assessment was it is obviously necessary to becoming a doctor. You have to make high grades all throughout. Like that's one of the things that this article stressed was high grades are necessary. Like you got to work your butt off in undergraduate so you can get into med school because that shows that you're capable of doing the work. And then also you want to make yourself stand out. Later when I talk about some of my interviews, like I'll tell you about one of them said that they were a firefighter. But so basically just things like being a firefighter and anything, like anything that you're interested in other than being in the medical field, it just helps you stand out as like a separate person that makes the admissions counselors just remember you, like being a firefighter or anything like that. And then the interviewing process is crucial for it. That's like one of the major things in becoming, in getting to medical school is the interviews for them. So practicing interviews is a very crucial part to that process. And this class is definitely helped out with that a lot. And then the last point was to apply to a lot and expect a lot of rejections from the schools. So that's basically saying like, the more that you apply to, the more high the chances of you will get into one of them that you apply. And that makes a lot of sense. And then the next research assessment I did was why med students should study the business of medicine. And basically I learned how a lot of medical students come out of school and they lack any basic knowledge of the business world that's like that most people need. And, and it's actually crucial to being a doctor because you have to deal with a lot of money and expensive with patients and everything and like your paychecks. So it's a very crucial thing to know as a doctor and you wouldn't expect that because you just think that they're a doctor. All they have to deal with is medicine and not business. And so the next major point was health care and reform makes it necessary. So at this point in time, as you know, Obamacare and other health care reforms are like changing the whole medical industry and profession. So knowing a lot more about business helps you out a lot more with knowing how to deal with that and how that's going to affect you and your profession in the future. And then one of the last points was it's important for a doctor to oversee and market clinic. So basically that's more if you have your private practice or you like work with other doctors in a group practice, but still like knowing that basic business knowledge is very crucial and important for you to be able to oversee, like market your clinic, know how to deal with patient um, accounts and stuff like that. And that was just a very useful article. And the next research assessment I did was Obamacare's impact on doctors. And I kind of got interested in this from the last article talking about um, all the reforms in healthcare. And it basically talks about how it doesn't exactly have a positive effect on the uh, medical profession in any way. And it talks about how it compromises the independence and integrity of medical professions, how like, there's more government control over all of the doctors and what you do so you don't get to do what you want to do as easily you don't get to treat patients as easily either and also it's like a flawed physician payment system and it basically just the way that uh, the Obamacare uh, works is it doesn't exactly it makes everything a lot harder for physicians overall getting paid and with dealing with patients and also it doesn't cover what all patients need to be covered which is what, what I think is a crucial part of that. And with one of my interviews, I learned more about this also, like how patients will go into the doctor and will need to like, look, just go in to consult with the doctor. And the Obamacare plan will cover that, but then whenever they actually have to get a surgery or something that's very, like, that they actually really need, then Obamacare, the healthcare plans like that will not cover that. And that seems like it's kind of a waste because what they need to be covered isn't getting covered, so it kind of seems pointless. And the last research assessment was our UNT visit this year, and I went to two classes while I was there, and the first one was Sociology of Sport, and we talked about student-athletes' troubles in school, and it was really interesting because it helps you take a different look at things, like instead of looking from the perspective of just like, they're an athlete in college, like they got their life set, 
it basically shows how most don't go professional and they need like that college degree but also the problem is like they don't get helped out enough to pass their classes and like because they're so busy with all their athletics and sports they're constantly like practicing that they don't have time to actually do the school work that they need to do to graduate and get a degree with it's vital to their whole college experience and that class was really interesting I really enjoyed that and then the next class I went to was intro to kinesiology and basically kinesiology is the study of movement and body movements and in that we talked about the different careers in kinesiology and um, basically it just we talked about how uh, there's like physical therapists health instructors and just a lot of basic things that like that and even though these aren't careers that like interest me, it was just interesting to see like all the different careers that are out there in the study of movement and just like that health career. And then the next thing that I did this year, which was a major part of ISM this year, was the interviews. And I did five interviews with different orthopedists specializing in different things. My first interview was with Dr. Shane Miller and he works at Children's Medical Center Plano and he's a pediatric sport medicine and orthopedic doctor. And whenever I talked with him, I learned about sports medicine and basically how it, like, like I said in the research assessment, how it specializes with any athletic injuries and helps heal athletes. And he also emphasized to me to pursue the career that is fun for me. Like no matter what it is, if it's fun for me and if it's what I want to do, then do it. Like, don't do things just for the money or like because of the stability or just do it if it's fun for you. And also a key point that he um, emphasized was communication and basically being able to communicate with the patient is vital because you need to know what's wrong with them and you want to know every little detail so you can help heal them. And also to be able to do that, knowing Spanish is very important in the South, as we know. Like in Texas, a lot of the population speaks Spanish, and some people don't speak English at all. So knowing Spanish helps break that language barrier and speak to more patients, and you don't have to like go through a translator or anything. So that is very helpful. And um, the next interview I did was with Dr. Robert Taylor, and he works at Stonebriar Foot and Ankle, and he's a podiatrist. And podiatry is basically the it's an orthopedic doctor for the foot and ankle. And he emphasized, like the last interview, was to make sure you do what you want in life. And like, basically he just talked about how you shouldn't do things because of the money. You should do it because it's what you want to do and nothing else matters. He also emphasized that listening is very important and make sure you have the right motivations. The listening part, like with the do last doctor, communication, how you need to listen to the patient and really hear what they're saying, not just, there's a difference between listening and hearing, and how hearing is just like hearing them say the words, but listening is really taking what they say and applying it. And then he said to make sure you have the right motivations. That's basically the saying, applying to the whole, make sure you do what you want, where you should do what you want because it's what you love and what you're motivated to do, rather than be motivated by money or some other circumstances. The next interview I did was with Dr. John Crates. He works at Plano Orthopedic Sports Medicine and the Spine Center. And he's an orthopedic surgeon and foot and ankle specialist. And what interested me with this interview was how he became interested in orthopedics in the same way as me. Because he, um, as a kid, he did play lots of sports and he actually got injured to the point where he could not play anymore so then he just worked with like the team doctors and stuff which was really cool to me to see how that's how he got interested and it's really similar to how I got interested in the field. And he talks about how the path to becoming a doctor is challenging and I mean that's pretty obvious because you have to go through eight years of medical school. I mean you first have to get into medical school school but then on top of that eight years of medical school and then residency and fellowships. So this path to becoming a doctor is an extremely hard one and you've got to be motivated to do it. And he also reiterated, reiterated the points of communication and listening and how important that is to the whole process of patient care and um, interacting with patients. The next interview I did was with Dr. Kendall Carl and he works at Texas Spine Consultants and he's a spine specialist. He talked about how business is important in medicine and how 
um, most, like in my research assessment, it emphasized the points how most people do not know anything about business coming out of medical school and how it's a vital thing to being a doctor and how he just uses it every day. It also talks about how you never clock out as a doctor. Basically, even whenever you're not on call, you're always working and you're always thinking about your job. It's like your job becomes your whole entire life. So basically, you never clock out because you're always working on something, learning something new, researching new things. And because the medical profession is always changing, so you always you never can clock out really. It also talks about the negativity of Obamacare and how it hasn't it's had a negative effect on him and his uh, business. And also talks about how ignorance is bliss. This kind of applies to the whole medical school thing and how you need to have tunnel vision and focus on what you want, not think about how to get there and that applies to the whole medical school thing where like you got to think about becoming a doctor rather than the challenge of going through medical school and all the hard things so I guess that applies to the whole ignorance is bliss thing because like the less you know about what you have to do the less you'll doubt it's what you want to do because if you think about the whole like even me now after doing all the research seeing how long it takes and what all you have to do to become a doctor it kind of has Gives you a little bit of doubt, even if it's no, even if you know it's exactly what you want to do. And the last interview I did was with Dr. Bruce Douthit, and he works at Oasis Orthopedic and Sports Injury Specialist, and he is a sports medicine doctor. Talked about being confident but not cocky, and to make patients comfortable. And the whole confidence thing is part of making patients comfortable, and having a sense of like being cocky, patients wouldn't exactly like you and. It just comes off bad, but being confident makes the patients feel comfortable because, like, they know exactly, they know you know exactly what you want to do, and like you know what you're doing to heal them. And everyone wants to know that the doctor taking care of them knows what they're doing and will treat them the right way. So that's a very vital part to patient care. He also talked about the future of medicine and how it not only is going into uh, very techno techn technological but also business and how everything like technology is taking over so you need to like not only going through medical school but taking like computer science classes and any kind of tech classes are very important and helps you learn a lot more because like I've seen um, from what I've seen there's a lot of there's a lot of technology that goes into like computers and stuff so it's very important to that and also he talks about business and reiterated the point of the whole um, talked about the, all the medical care stuff and how business is important for that and is, will be important in the future whenever things change. And so those were my five interviews and now to my mentor. My mentor is actually Dr. Kendall Carl who I had my fourth interview with. He's an orthopedic spine specialist and he works at Texas Spine Consultants. He did his undergraduate education at the Citadel College and he attended the University of Florida College of Medicine for medical school and then he did his residency at University of Florida, Florida College of Medicine Department of Orthopedics. And then he did his fellowship at Baylor University Medical Center. He's been in practice for 12 years and why I sucked at Dr. Carl. So how I first found him was through Dr. Douthit and o Oasis, but whenever I interviewed him, it just he just felt like someone who teach me a lot and I could learn a lot from throughout the year, and I just felt he felt like a good fit for me and he could be a great mentor to me. So like I decided on him over the others, and some of the highlights of my mentorship so far this year are I have gone and viewed two surgeries now. And those have been extremely interesting to me because it's like a surreal experience because before doing it, like you see like blood and surgeries and stuff like that on TVs and like shows like Grey's Anatomy, but in real life it's extremely different and it's very surreal because you're standing there over the operating table watching someone cut into another human and it's kind of crazy and you feel weird at first, but once you get used to it, it's just like just another day at the job. So. I feel like it was a good thing that I didn't pass out or didn't feel nauseous though, which, yeah, I mean, it just seems like whatever to me, but those were some of my favorite experiences, watching like my mentor do spine surgeries. I really enjoyed interacting with other doctors doing it and just like the whole environment of the operating room and it was just 
there's some great life experiences that I'll probably never forget. And next was my original work. And so for my original work, I did a general step-by-step -step guide to diagnosing, diagnosing a patient. How I did it, I did a lot of not only observing my um, mentor, but also research. And by doing that, I could just figure out the basic process that my mentor and other doctors go through to figure out what's wrong with the patient and how to heal them. And what I learned from this whole process was I learned a lot about patient care and everything that goes into treating the patient and what all needs to be done like from start to finish. And the real world purpose of this is for people who don't know much about medicine, they can look at this and see how to go ba like how to go through the thing and then also uh, interns at hospitals and any people who are just like just now getting started off in um, the medical profession and world of medicine, they can look through this and kind of get a general idea of what they should be doing if they're not exactly sure. And so, general steps to diagnosing patients for orthopedic spine specialists. And step one is before meeting with a patient, all of their charts and information should be thoroughly looked over. Basically, this is looking through the patient information, making sure they don't have any prior conditions and learning about the patient, which is really important to the whole thing in constructing diagnosis because there might be a little thing from their past that helps you figure out what to do and what you can't do like they might be allergic to some medicine or some kind of treatment might be a problem for them next step is depending on the problem next step would be to, to take a CT scan x-ray and or MRI, MRI of the patient's affected area and these should be gone over thoroughly by the radiologist and by yourself, the physician, to catch all visible issues. Just by looking at this, you can learn a lot. And from um, being with my mentor, I've seen this a lot of the time. Like he'll just look at the CT scans and like see exactly what's wrong with the patient and see where it's originating from. And it's really cool how much you can see and how like distinct it is and showing the inside of the body. Next step, step three is to speak with a patient thoroughly about their situation. You can get a lot of information just by talking to them. And this reiterates the whole communication is key part I talked about earlier in my research and interviews and how you, can, you need to get as much information from the patient as possible so you can give a accurate diagnosis of them and figure out how to heal them. Next step is step four, it's physically examining the patient's area of which the pain is originating from. And step five is when dealing with the spine, there's numbness, like part of figuring out what's wrong with them is numbness or loss of strength. If they might have that in their feet or hands, that helps you originate where it's coming from. Like if there's um, pain in the hands, it usually originates from the upper back and the thoracic spine, where if it's like pain and numbness in the feet, it usually comes from the lower lumbar spine. And then the next step is depending on if they have loss of strength or numbness in their feet and hands, you uh, do range of motions tests. Like with the feet, uh, the doctor will have them stand on their tippy toes and then stand on their heels and things like that just to make sure like they have strength and are able to do that. Next step is by this point, diagnosis should have been reached. And then you'd be talking about treatment options with the patient. And at the end of the day, it comes down to what they really want. Like even though you might suggest surgery, and going one way, they might not want surgery, so they might just not do it. And you gotta like, you just gotta go with them. You can't make them do what they don't want to do. It's all about patient care. And so basically, you just go over. There's like different ways that you can. Um, there's many different ways that you can heal spine stuff. And there's basically you can do injections, which are just injecting around the nerve, and that helps with pain. And then there's like creams you can put on the back actually that helps like with the pain also and medication and there's also like surgeries as you know and then that was the original work and for my final product I did ACL, inju ACL injuries and their prevention okay. how I did it to do this I did a lot of research and talked to multiple different doctors to find out all the information about the topic and basically I took all the research, put it together, and then compiled it and put it into a PowerPoint for like, an easy PowerPoint to look through for people to understand. 
And the real world application is athletes, like ACL injuries are really horrible for any athlete because it could end your career. And not only end it, if you get one, you're out for five months or more at a time. And like that's almost a whole season. And that's just horrible. And it kind of ends your athletic career. So preventing that is very vital to many athletes. And so this is my final product. And what is the ACL? The anterior cruciate, anterior cruciate ligament is one of the four major ligaments in the knee. And it rides in the very center of the knee. And it keeps it stable and injuring the ACL. It is most commonly injured in sports when there is forced twisting motion of the knee or when the knee is hit while your foot is planted. When the ACL is torn, it does not heal and you have to do some kind of reconstruction surgery to get it back to normal. And that's a picture of an ACL injury happening. And the reconstruction of the ACL. To reconstruct the ACL, grafts or tendons or ligaments are taken and put in place instead of the ACL. And they'll commonly take it from um, the patellar region and patellar tendon and take that and like to basically put holes in your femur and tibia and they'll like pull it through and it kind of just like replaces and heals. It's kind of crazy to think about that happening to your legs but then the recovery. Rehabilitation from ACL surgery is very complex. It may take from four to nine months of rehab to return to your original athletic activities and additionally it may take a year or more for your knee to return to the way it was before the injury. So clearly, like I said earlier, it's a very long recovery process, and as an athlete, you do not want to go through that if you're trying to, especially if you're trying to go play college sports or in the NFL and it's like your career, you don't want to injure that because that ends, the, like just ends it all or, prolong, or prolongs the time you're out doing what you love to do. And are you at risk? The highest risk sports for ACL injuries include basketball, soccer, volleyball, football, and rugby. Basically, doing anything that requires pivoting, jumping, cutting, or changing direction increases your risk. And also, you're at increased risk if you have poor physical conditioning. Basically, that's like saying if you just lay around and don't do anything, and you try to go out and do a lot of activity, then your body's at greater risk because it's not used to doing the activity. And also, you're at increased risk if you are of the female gender. So this goes into more about the female gender and why that's why you're at increased risk if you're a female over being a male. And so they get, t they're 10 times more likely to sustain a knee injury, such as the ACL injury. And this is because in female athletes, they lack control over certain leg muscles. And between increased lateral trunk motion and coronal plane abduction, valgus torques of the knee, the ACL injury rate is increased. So basically saying like they have lack of nor neuromuscular control over the lower body. So because of that, it increases the rate of injury because they can't control the knees. And like in that picture, it shows how like on the right, like they stop more like that because like that's how their body just normally does it. And doing that puts strain on the knee, especially on the ACL, and that increases the injury rate by tenfold, as you can see. And basically also the alignment of the knee and the anatomy of the woman body also increases the rate because like that's just the shape of their body and the way it's set up, it makes them want to stop like that whenever they like jump and stop. And then how can you prevent it? So there's, there's some basic ways you can before, like appropriately warming up, working strength conditioning with focus on thigh, leg, and knee, using proper technique and using proper equipment. And these are a bunch of pre preventative exercises that can be done also. So there's stretching, like calf stretches, quadricep stretch, hamstring stretches, and your thigh stretch, and these are all descriptions of like how to do the stretches specifically. And there's hip flexor stretches, and there's strengthening, which is the second part of it, walking lunges, hamstrings, single toe raises, and then plyometric exercises, lateral hops over cone, forward backward hops over cone, single leg hops over cone, vertical jumps with headers, scissor jumps, and then the last part of it is agility, and that's shuttle run with forward backward running, diagonal runs, bounding run, and those are all ways, like exercise you can do for agility, strength, plyometrics that all help prevent it. And then Coach, I forgot to tell you before, but I have a video to play. You should probably let me know before. I'm gonna, I, forgot, I gotta like click the link and put it on.
I don't think the link's working. 